This video is about um, sampling and bias. There are six main methods of sampling that we're going to talk about. Two of them are very likely to give biased samples. The, um, the first one is voluntary response and um, that's where the people who participate in the survey or what have you um, decide themselves whether or not to participate. For that reason, any survey that you send in the mail or post on a website, um, these will automatically be voluntary response because people can either uh, throw away your survey or ignore your survey or they can choose to take the survey. Um, voluntary response is usually going to be biased because um, only the people who care strongly about the issue will bother with the survey. The next method is the convenience method and that's where the uh, person conducting the survey or whatever just chooses a group that happens to be nearby. Um, this is often biased because uh, a group that's already sitting together for whatever reason often will have a lot in common, um, more in common than the general population. And whatever it is they have in common can be a, a biasing um, variable. All right, um, we have four more methods that are less biased than that. The least bias is called simple random. That's where every single individual in the population um, gets a number or some identifying thing that can be randomly generated. And so um, by using a computer or a calculator or something, you can just uh, randomly pick uh, the members of a sample. Um, another sampling method is called systematic. That's where you use some sort of a system, like you pick every fifth person or every tenth object or something like that. Um, that'll be systematic. And um, another one is called stratified random. Um, that's where you, um, if there are different categories, um, like say if we're talking about a school and uh, a high school where you have freshmen, sophomore, juniors, and seniors, you might say, okay, um, we, we're going to make sure that we survey 50 freshmen, 50 sophomores, 50 juniors, and 50 seniors. Um, but within each one of those uh, categories, you're still going to randomly pick your 50 freshmen and randomly pick your 50 sophomores, etc. cetera. Uh, but because you have these categories where you're guaranteeing ahead of time that you're going to have a certain number of each category. Um, th those are your strata. Those categories are what make it stratified. And then you've got cluster sampling. This is the last one we will discuss. And that's where you randomly pick a group um, boom, uh, or uh, you randomly pick perhaps several groups um, but once you pick those groups every member of the group gets surveyed. Um, so for example, if um, say if I were thinking of a county like Fulton County, uh, Georgia, if you were to randomly pick 10 schools in Fulton County school system, um, you know, using a number generator or something. Um, but then once you pick those 10 schools randomly, uh, everybody at those 10 schools gets surveyed. That would be an example of cluster sampling. Or if you picture a single school um, and you randomly picked 10 classrooms in the school, uh, but then once you pick those 10 classrooms, everyone in the room gets a survey. That would be another example of cluster sampling. Now, um, so just to review, the methods were voluntary response, convenience, simple random, systematic, stratified random, and cluster. Okay, so let's tell the type of sample that each situation represents. You're interested in finding out if students at your school think that fine, fine arts programs are receiving enough funding you decide to, one, 
Use a written survey that you give to people sitting at your lunch table. All right, well, that is going to be convenience. That's a convenience sample because you just pick the group that happens to be at your lunch table. Okay, uh, what about number two? Put a table at the entrance of the cafeteria with a sign directing students to complete the survey if they want to and drop it in the box. Well, this is going to be voluntary response. Um, voluntary response because people can choose to do the survey or not do the survey. Uh, we're leaving it entirely up to them. So that makes it voluntary response. Okay, number three. Randomly selected students from each of the four grades. Okay, um, so it sounds like we're guaranteeing that we um, have students from each of the four grades, so that makes this stratified random. Number four, you randomly choose eight classes to survey. This is going to be the cluster method. Number five, you put all names in a hat and draw half of the names out to ask. Uh, well, that's going to be simple random since every single person had an equal chance of being picked. All right, this video is about experiments, observational studies, and margin of error. The school board wants to find out how the community feels about a proposed addition to the high school. There are 15,000 people living in the school district. The school board would like to survey 800 people. What is the population? What is the sample? Well, the population is the entire group in which you are interested. And the sample is the smaller subset of the population um, that you're going to question or study. So in this case, um, the community um, is the 15,000 people living in the school district. So that is the population. The 800 people in the survey are the sample. Dr. Jones wants to see whether the gender of members in a tribe in the Amazon plays a role in the order in which they are served their meals. Is this an observational study or an experiment? This is an observational study because um, the researcher is not subjecting the people to any experimental conditions. There's no treatment being imposed on anyone. Um, Dr. Jones is just observing and recording what's happening anyway. Dr. Jones also wants to see whether the monkeys in the area grow larger when eating their native diet or when given manufactured monkey pellets. He feeds one group of young monkeys their native diet for a year. He feeds another group monkey pellets. <clears throat> After a year, he compares the sizes of the monkeys in the first group to the sizes of the monkeys in the second group. First of all, is this an experiment or an observational study? Um, well, clearly this is an experiment because Dr. Jones is imposing a treatment on the monkeys. <clears throat> um, he's deciding who's going to get the native diet and who's going to get the monkey pellets. The treatment group is the group of monkeys um, that are getting the pellets, the monkey pellets. The control group is the group of monkeys eating their natural diet. What are the treatments? <clears throat> there are two treatments. Uh, one treatment is the native diet and the other treatment is the monkey pellet diet. 100 students out of 1,200 at a school were surveyed. 14 said they had an after-school job. The margin of error is plus or minus 10 percent. Predict the number of students in the population that would answer similarly. To answer this question we have to think about uh, what did the sample say? So um, the key numbers are here. There were 14 that said that they had an after-school job out of 
100 students that were surveyed. So 14 out of 100, of course, is 14%. All right, so that's what the sample is saying. Um, but the margin of error is plus or minus 10%. So we're going to take what the sample says, and we will subtract and add the margin of error. And um, it will be very likely that the true answer uh, for the population will be in here somewhere. So if we say 14 uh, minus 10% and then we do 14 plus the 10% then that should give us the answer alright so that's going to be 4% to 24% alright so we can be pretty confident that the true percent of the population that has an after-school job is somewhere between 4% and 24%. All right, but in this case, they're not act actually asking us uh, 4%. They said, predict the number of students. So let's translate this into numbers of students. So um, 4%, um, now we know that there are a total of 1,200 students at the school. So 4% of 1,200 we can find by doing 0 0.04 times 1,200. All right, so that would be 48 students. All right, now 24% would be 0.24 times 1,200. All right, that'd be 288 students. All right, so this is the best we can do, somewhere between 48 students and 288 students. Number 10, a business magazine mailed a questionnaire to the human resource directors of all the fortune 500 companies and received responses from 23 percent of them those responding reported that they did not find that such surveys intruded significantly on their workday in this scenario the population is the group of human resource directors of all the fortune 500 companies um, now, on the other hand, the sample is the group of directors who actually responded to the survey. Now, uh, this sampling method is clearly going to be voluntary response, since the directors themselves can just decide if they feel like filling out the survey or not. And um, last, we're supposed to say any potential sources of bias that we can detect. One source of bias is that directors who feel more strongly about the survey or are more likely to respond. Another source of bias is that um, the directors that are busier, have more on their plate, are less likely to respond because they're just too uh, swamped with their work. Researchers waited outside a bar they had randomly selected from a list of such establishments. They stopped every fifth person who came out of the bar and asked whether he or she thought drinking and driving was a serious problem. So the first question is, what is the population? Um, the population is unclear for this problem. Perhaps it is all of the people in the world or in the city or the state. We, we really can't know what the population is just from the wording of this question. The sample is the group of people who they asked about drunk driving. It said they're asking every fifth person who came out of the bar. So whoever they asked, um, that's the sample. This is the systematic sampling method because of the way they asked every fifth person. 
A source of bias is that they are only asking people coming out of a bar. Non-drinkers may have different opinions about drinking than drinkers.